Good morning. words from Mark chapter 14 verses 3 through 9. While he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment and wine, and she, opened, she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. Truly, I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Hello, y'all. I'm so glad to see you all out there. Um, as I have said to several of my colleagues, I'm a teacher, not a and they said, well, teach to us then. So, okay, I'm pretending that this is a common session in a, in a program we used to have. So, for the next 20 minutes, please hold together two metaphors and two concepts. The metaphors are a clearing, see that upper left-hand slide, like a clearing in the woods, and a dinner table, upper right, and the uh, two concepts are beauty, represented by that beautiful color, and death, represented by the beautiful sculpture by Michelangelo. So our text for today speaks of a clearing that is created in the middle of a dinner party, and it evokes beauty and acknowledges death. So let's see what it might mean for us. First, we'll consider the metaphor of a clearing. I borrowed it from the physician and writer, Dr. Rita Sharon. I use her work in narrative medicine as I teach ethics with medical students from UNC who come to Asheville for their clinical training. Dr. Sharon says this, our work in narrative medicine opens up a clearing that invites clinicians, patients, patients' families, writers, teachers, corporate leaders, all who have a stake in health, to gather in safety to work towards common 
common goals. Now, Dr. Sharon credits Toni Morrison and her book, Beloved, for the metaphor. In that remarkable novel, it doesn't have a picture of the cover of Beloved, but Toni Morrison's face is so beautiful in that, and I also love the subtitle, Writing the Moral Imagination, um, because that's what we're invited to do in something like married ethics. In that remarkable novel, the main character, whose name is Suggs, leads a group of people who were all freed, at least for the time being, from their former lives of enslavement to a clearing in a forest every Sunday. Here are Morrison's words. When the warm weather came, baby subs, holy, followed by every black man, woman, and child who could make it through, took her great heart to the clearing. A wide open place cut deep in the woods, no white knew for what, at the end of a path known only to deer and who ever cleared the land in the first place. Here, she said, in this here place we love flesh. Flesh that weeps, laughs, flesh that dances on bare feet in grass. Love it. Love it hard. Yonder, they do not love your flesh. They despise it. Oh, my people, they do not love your hands. Those they only use, tie, bind, chop off, and leave empty. Love your hands. Love them. Raise them up and kiss them. Touch others with them. Pat them together, stroke them on your face, because they don't love that either. You love to love it. You. The dark, dark river. Love it, love it, and the beat and beating heart. Love that too, more than eyes or feet, more than lungs that have yet to draw free air. Hear me now, love your heart. For this, voice of baby subs and the images she evokes and the message and the image of the clearing and let's look at the metaphor at the dinner table. When I was a child there were always students in our home. My dad was a college professor and he taught math and his students came from all over the world and had very different backgrounds from my own. So the people at our dinner table at Thanksgiving, for example, were my dad's students, and they were from China, India, Malaysia, Iran, Jamaica, uh, and they were Christian and Jewish and Muslim and Buddhist and Hindu and none of the above, and they were all just really cool and really good people. My child's eyes could see pretty easily. Those dinner table conversations that I witnessed as a child with inclusion, openness, and respect for peoples of all the world helped create some cognitive dissonance between the ways that my family lived out what it means to be Christian and what I experienced out there. So for example, in third grade, my friend Rebecca was bullied by other kids in class. They called her a stinky Jew. I came home, asked my parents about that, and they said, Invite her over. How about tomorrow? Stand next to her in line. Speak up for her. Fourth grade, confirmation class at church, when my beloved preacher, Gordon, said something that seemed to indicate that Christians were better or something like that. I don't remember exactly what he said. And I remember thinking about all of those people around our dinner table and my friend Rebecca. And I raised my hand to ask a question. I don't remember his answer. I do remember thinking, school, integration happened, and I became friends with classmates like G. Lewis, with whom I'm still Facebook friends, who were black and had dreams just like I did, but had not the grounding to imagine them being realized until we were in middle school and high school. It was called junior high back then, middle school. Until Rosa Parks, Dr. King, Malcolm X, Fannie Lou Hamer came into dinner table around our country through this television box, interrupted them, homes into which they had not been invited, 
changing the conversation with acts of courage, vulnerability, beauty, and grace. So once again, the tensions between the experiences of inclusion, forgiveness, love, and the experiences of exclusion, judgment, and condemnation, they continue to propel me throughout the rest of my life to, to keep finding something more beautiful, something more whole, that seems to reflect something more of the whole world. And this is at the heart of the challenge we face today. If we listen to the kind of story that Megan read so well before I began, we're called at least to pay attention. So let's listen. The stories for today take place at a dinner table and each tells the clearing created by a woman and Jesus. This El Greco painting um, echoes both Mark's and Matthew's versions. There are four stories. There's one in each one of the four Gospels. But they don't all agree exactly on the details. The main themes they got down. Mark, you heard before I began. The woman is not named, the home is that of Simon the leper. Notice he's having a dinner party, Simon the leper. Um, she anoints his head, uh, which is something done to begin a king's rule, and it's not ever done by a woman, especially one who's not invited. Uh, the men at the table are outraged, they scold her, and they say the expensive oil could be sold and the money given to the poor. Well, they've got a point. Matthew's version is pretty much the same as Mark's. the woman a sinner from the city. You know what that means. The home is that of Simon the Pharisee, and he judges Jesus for allowing this woman to touch him, to kiss his feet, to, to, to wipe them with the powerfully scented oil, nard, to drench them with her tears, and then she wipes them with her hair. He judges Jesus and the woman. And in John, the woman is given a name. Mary of Bethany, so she's the sister of Martha and Lazarus and some other stories. She bathes his feet with the nard and with her tears and wipes them with her hair. In this version, there's a name given to the man who scolds her. That name is Judas. Well, of course, he's got an escape route for the bad guys, right? And he's, but he says this money is wasteful. It is a wasteful way to use the, the, the money should be um, given to the poor. All right, let's see if we can make sense of this. This interruption of the dinner party opens up a floor, a clearing of sorts. Jesus names what this woman has done as beautiful, as good. Now, that's what he says. She's done a beautiful thing in one translation. She's done a good thing for me in the translation that Megan just read. So, one definition of beauty, and y'all there are whole, you know, some disciplines of philosophy talk about aesthetics all, you know, they could talk about it for way longer than 20 minutes. But we're just going to use one definition, and it's from the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, who happens to be a personal favorite of mine, and we're going to talk about what he calls maximum strength of beauty. So get that phrase in your head, maximum strength of beauty. It's a really wonderful metaphor in itself. And here's how you know it when you see it. Contrasts are held in tension without freedom. Contrasts are held in tension without breaking. All right, how do we understand that? Well, first look at a guitar, like this stunning guitar in Plato's Plato. <laughs> it does begin with a P, it's Picasso. Um, <laughs> in Picasso's um, old man with the guitar. I had this as a poster in my college dorm room. And when I was looking for something to illustrate this concept, I went, oh, yes, back to my college dorm room. Look at the contrasts here. First of all, the guitar itself. Without being, being, being secured at either end, uh, the string makes a, well, hardly any sound, and, and it's not a pretty one. Um, but when you have them tightened, contrasts hold in tension without them. And then look at this. Of the reasons that Picasso 
our streets? What contrasts are held in tension without breaking? Well, you've got a woman at an all-male gathering, and that's not supposed to happen. She's not invited. Uh, she breaks in, and who is she? I don't know. Mary of Bethany? Maybe. A prostitute from the city? Maybe. Or just a woman, unnamed, as Matthew and Mark have her. That's the role given to most of the women in life. This woman takes an alabaster jar, which if you are down here, you can see way down at the sort of, um, what's that, five o'clock range of, of, of the picture. It itself is expensive, beautiful, and exotic. Inside the sealed jar is this very uh, uh, elegant and highly perfumed ointment called nard. It's made from the spike nard plant. And the smell of the ointment fills the room when she breaks open the seal to pour it on Jesus' head or his feet and the Persians and their kings. Y'all actually considered, I checked out um, going to the French Bar Food Co-op or Green Life to see if I could get some nard to get that smell in here <laughs> so you get you know, another part of your senses going. But it was way more expensive than a teacher's salary could do even to make a good point. So imagine this incredible smell filling the room. Smells say our biologist friends is one of our most powerful senses and perhaps that smell with its sensual pheromones had an effect on the men gathered that made them even more uncomfortable than having the woman break into their party when invited. And then, to make it worse, after she comes in, she loosens her hair. That's not supposed to happen, except in the presence of your husband in first century Palestine. And she pours the oil, she weeps, and she wipes both the oil and her tears with her loosened hair. Right, you got that picture? It's at least inappropriate. It's, um, it's an intimate act. It's um, shocking. Uh, so we at least have an issue of etiquette, an etiquette issue. But actually what I love is that you got some full-flown ethical dilemmas here. Let's look at them. And by the way, don't assume just because Jesus sides with the woman that that's the only morally reasonable way to look at it. There are always different perspectives, different voices, different values. So we got the outraged men at the table. They, they, they scroll, judge, cry out with righteous indignation. Why was this ointment wasted? We could have sold it and given it to the poor. Basically, y'all, 300 denarii, as, as Megan read, that's about one year's worth of wages for a peasant. That's a living wage for a year. Um, Luke's Simon judges the woman as a prostitute, judges Jesus for touching him so intimately. If this man were really a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman she is. <clears throat> John uses the same words, put the, puts them in Judas's mouth. He's the one bad apple in the lot. Um, again, even if it was Judas who raised the question, it's not a point. And then to make it even more confusing, did you hear one of the last lines that Megan read? So this is Jesus, who was the same guy who himself was homeless. He got food because people invited him to dinner. He uh, was on the side of the poor. He said, when you feed the hungry, care for the sick, clothe the naked, visit the people in prison, you're doing so unto me. He's the one who says, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have with me. Well, there's some contrasts here, right? Can we hold them in tension? What are we going to do with this? So let's look at these tensions. Inclusion versus exclusion. Hospitality versus rules. Grace and forgiveness versus condemnation and judgment. Principle versus passion. Power of money. Power of love. Use of money for others. Use of money for worship or for beauty. Propriety versus intimacy. Social power versus personal power. Male power versus female power. Oh my, this is rich. So what were Jesus' options at this point if we didn't know how the story goes on? Well, he could have agreed with the disciples, embarrassed the woman, shamed her, reinforced his message of being on the side of the poor and against extravagances, reinforced the status quo. He could have done that. He could have gone outside with her to help her save face, but, you know, get her in her proper place and come back in and say to the disciples, okay, guys, Andy up, 300 denarii. You know, could have done that. But then here are the options that our gospel writers develop. Why do we trouble the woman? She's done a good thing for me. She's done a beautiful thing for me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she's done it to prepare me for burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. And then he goes 
thousand years of storytellers about Jesus kind of overlooked that one phrase. We don't even know who she was. How do we tell the story of the unnamed and shamed woman? Okay, if we were to do what Jesus suggests here, what would we say and what would we do? Well, let's see what she's done. A beautiful thing, a good thing, prepare my body for burial. So she's done a beautiful or good thing to me. It's a straight out affirmation of the good with the beautiful, with the true. That's no surprise to Plato. He equated those. And remember Whitehead's definition of beauty, contrast telling tension without breaking. So if we are to do beautiful things, we should name contrasts, recognize them when they exist, black and white, native peoples and colonizers, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Sikh, atheist, believer. Name them, hold them, honor them, feel them. That's what Jesus does here. And the contrasts are held in tension. He doesn't deny it. He doesn't pretend she's not there. He engages the men in conversation while keeping her next to him and even having her touch him without breaking. Oh, now we come to our job. Let's see how. Let's see what that means. Where can we create clearings, such as this woman that Jesus did? Where are the dinner tables to which whoever comes has a voice? Where can we notice and create beauty that holds contrasts and tension without breaking? Is this an election year? <laughs> so, okay. For their example, are there any clearings that could hold together and hear people who find their truth in Donald Trump or Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio or find it in Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton? Could all of those people sit together at a dinner table? Some would say radical, a justice as you could possibly imagine on the Supreme Court. And the current, but old, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who is as far left as you could get on the Supreme Court. Um, these two, okay, there they are, far right and far left, but you know, can't win. Um, doesn't look like they have a lot in common, does it? They went dancing together. They were in plays together. They went to the opera together. So come next week. Let's explore this question more. Because um, we're going to explore this question at the next presidential election. With State Senators Terry Van Dyne and Tom Apodaca. Right here. This, this, this chapel. Now, let's get a little messier. Are there clearings that could hold together and hear people who find their truth in Black Lives Matter and those who find their truth in Jesus Saves and those who find their truth in Allahu Akbar? Are there ways that, that, that listening to all of those voices can occur, at least in our own heads? Another thing that Jesus says is, this woman has prepared my body for burial. She acknowledges that death is present, that we need to live as if we know that not only do we die, but so do those whom we love. The poet Mary Oliver puts it this way. To live in this world, you must be able to do three things. To love what is mortal, to hold it against your bones, knowing your own life depends upon it. And when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. This woman's courageous, beautiful act and Jesus' bridge-building, home-making, clearing-making actions challenge us. What can we learn and carry into our lives today? Who's intruding on your dinner party? I 
and invite you. How can you pay attention? How can you listen to those voices? How can you find some beauty in that? And how can you tell about it in your life, in your friendships, in your work? Can you imagine a way in which the tables of power, wherever they are, maybe they're in a classroom, maybe they're in a dorm, maybe they're in a college, maybe they're in a community, can invite those who interrupt to bring their gifts, see the beauty that's possible? How do we greet and even notice the classmate of power that we usually ignore? In our life as a nation of 